everybody to a special episode today where we are going to learn from one of the greatest pitching coaches of all time. Leo Mazzoni is with us. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm kind of bored right now missing baseball, and uh, but uh, we had a great uh, revisit of the 95 World Championship and had a good time with that. But uh, I'll be glad when this thing's over and baseball can be played in, in our big league stadiums with the fans. I think we were all watching that, including uh, Caleb Davis, your protege, and the pitching coach at Furman. What's up, Caleb? How we doing, man? Thanks for having me on. No, thank you for uh, – what, what, did, what did your buddy call this? You were the brains behind this, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what he said. I don't know about all that. I'm just kind of sitting here watching you guys go at it. Uh, we also have Rob Friedman here, an analyst for ESPN and MLB, better known as Pitching Ninja and the creator of – Flat ground app. What's up, Rob? What's happening, Josh? How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm good. I'll get it started here. Leo, first question. Uh, was Sid Bream safe? Oh, yeah. By a Definitely. long shot. I mean, he was safe by a long shot considering he was carrying a piano on his back. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was, it was, it was, he was safe. And uh, Bonds, they wanted Bonds to move, up, move in and move over to the line a little bit. And he didn't move. Really? Well, yeah, that's what I heard. By the skin of the cleat, I believe, was the head. No, no, no. It was about three, four inches. Yeah, he was, <laughs> he was there, no doubt. Uh, yeah, okay. no doubt. So, Leo, what is it about um, your relationship with Caleb Davis that he was able to get you here with a, with a couple of guys like me and Rob? Well, I, I think I met Caleb here in Anderson when he was a pitching coach at Anderson College, and we struck up a friendship, and he was – I was looking for somebody to pass my stuff on to, just like Johnny Sane was looking for somebody years ago to pass it on to me. He picked me, and I accepted. There was a lot of people that didn't accept it, but I did. I because uh, knowledge is intimidating, and I've had a lot of people that I've tried to uh, uh, give my information to, and they get intimidated. But Caleb was all—he was hungry for information. We stuck struck up a friendship, and then he had an opportunity. So we we started talking pitching all the time, and then he had an opportunity to go to Furman. And Coach Harker at Furman played up through AAA ball, and and then we all struck a relationship up there. And uh, so he's got all my information because uh, the information that's being put out there now, I think, is uh, uh, not conducive to healthy arms. And, and uh, that's the thing that I was most proud of. And I think you're going to see Furman University, you, you are seeing them do the same thing where nobody breaks down and nobody misses starts. And that was my history in the minor leagues and the, and the big leagues. So um, – uh, I'm glad that uh, Caleb is, is a good friend of mine and Coach Harker is a good friend of mine. And, and I couldn't pick a better person to uh, put my uh, – give all my information to than Caleb. Caleb, Caleb. we're in a completely different era now uh, than when Leo was coaching. <clears throat> what is it, though, that he was doing that has been extremely useful to you in, in bringing it into this generation of training guys? Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, different era, but whether it's, you know, 1990 or 2020 or 2050, you know, the greatest currency any pitcher can have is, is out getting. And uh, Leo's guys did that as good as anybody. And so as a pitching coach, you know, regardless of what level you're at, if you can pick the brain of a guy that's the mastermind behind some of the greatest out getters in the history of our sport, you're going to do that. And, you know, Leo touched on it, but the thing that drew me to him and, and what he did the most, when I first met Leo, I was only four years into college coaching. And, uh, you know, I gauged my success as a pitching coach, you know, based on the amount of, of velo my guys may have gained from a, a September in the, in the fall until the end of the season in, in May or June. And, you know, I didn't realize that the biggest part of that was health and durability. And, you know, when I had an opportunity to, to get a chance to talk with Leo and, and pick his brain about some of that stuff, that was the thing that drew me to him the most was how consistent his guys were able to, as he calls it, go to the post to do their job every out. And I think it was, what, some, some 500 and some unbelievable amount of consecutive starts in a row where his guys were able to, to go to the post, so to speak, and, and do their job. And for us – you know, that's all I can ask. Obviously, I, I tell my guys at the end of the day, and we're, we're here to develop you, but we can't do that if you're spending the majority of your time in the training room. And so, first and foremost, how can I keep my guys healthy? And, you know, Leo has a recipe book as good as anybody in, in the world to do that. 
Hey, Leo, you mentioned learning from Johnny Sane, and I've gone back, I mean, I don't know if you, you probably don't follow me on Twitter, but I, I am a big Johnny Sane guy and, uh, and have put up a lot of his stuff. And I, I agree, I think he was ahead of his time on a lot of things um, from the Sane spinner that he had, right. to teaching spin axis. Yeah, um, right, spin rates, yeah. now they call it. Right, as well as things like uh, throwing programs, not making pitchers run just for the sake of running. He said that that was a lazy way. It was because coaches didn't want to teach anything as right. they made their pitchers run. And to teach pitcher, to treat pitchers like they're first-class citizens. What type of things have you learned from, from Johnny Sane? Well, you mentioned that a lot because I know the, uh, uh, a lot of the pitchers that came over, like Maddox said, I love this place. We throw a lot and we run a little, right. and, you know, but, uh, and, and the thing was, Johnny was so far ahead of his time talking about spin rates or, and talking about backspin on a fastball and, and, and uh, changing the direction of the spin on a breaking ball, a throw and turn breaking ball, all these theories and changing speeds was his number one m a priority, changing speeds. And he always used to tell me, you get hitters out five ways, stuff, movement, changes speeds, location, and motion. All five play a part in getting somebody out. So he would take me over. He had an RV that he, in spring training, and he would take me over to, because he didn't want to stay in a hotel. And he'd take me over to his RV, and, and, and we would sit there and fix cornbread beans and sip on a little vodka and talk pitching all, every night. And this man was well beyond his, his time. And he was – and. Other managers, a lot of managers feared, didn't like him. They, they were intimidated by him, you know. And he, so because he went to the Yankees and he was there for three years and they, you know, and, and it was Whitey Ford and Ralph Terry and, and the list goes on and on. He was there three years, then he goes to Minnesota. The same thing happens in Minnesota with, with Jim Cott and, and Mudcat Grant and all those. Now he goes to Detroit, Danny McLean and Mickey Lolich and Earl Wilson and Joe Sparman. And I did a seminar one time for John Sherholtz in Atlanta for the minor league organization when I was in the big leagues. And I was talking about when Sane got to Detroit, you know, and what they did. And, and this one scout said, ah, he was a 20-game winner before Sane got there. I said, yeah, but when he left, he was a 30-game winner, you know. And yeah, so yeah. It, and I thought about that when Stan Kasten asked me, what pitcher did I do the best job with all the great pitchers? I said, Greg Maddox. He goes, what? He goes, Greg Maddox was good when he got there. I said, yeah, and he remained good, too. Maybe got a little bit better. So that I have so many parallels with Sane. But what, what happened was Johnny was a, always has the opportunity to pitch, have pitchers in a four-man rotation. So but the baseball world went to a five, thinking that that's going to protect the pitchers and keep them healthier over the long haul. I had pitched in both when I was in the late 60s and 70s. I loved starting in a four-man rotation. I stayed sharper. Because you develop a pattern of pitch, off, side session, off, and pitch. Well, then the baseball world went to a five. And that, because they wanted to give the pitcher an extra day of rest. And I decided on my own, I was going to have that pitcher throw that extra day of rest. Only we were going to control the effort. And this is what Sane taught me too, more often, less exertion. If you went more often with less exertion, then – you were able to get on the mound and practice your craft more often, get some touch on the ball, you know, change speeds, move it around. And so Johnny taught me that. So I, I did it on my own, and the pitchers ended up loving it in the minor leagues. You know, the managers didn't care what I did. Hank Aaron was my boss. He said, I hired you to take care of the pitchers. Take care of them any way you want. Well, guess what? Then I gained a reputation of those guys staying healthy. Well, then when 86, when Bobby Cox came in, Bobby Cox said he was turning an offensive-oriented organization into a pitching one. Who's going to take care of the pitchers? Well, that, and this was in front of the entire organization in the big offices up in Fulton County Stadium. And I told him what I wanted to do. And a couple of the managers said, well, Leo has a you know, re track record here with us of no breakdowns, no sore arms. And so I explained what I was just telling you. And this other pit, there was four pitching coaches in there. I don't need to name their names. And one of them stood up and said um, – well, I, I think he, he talks to Bobby and the, and the general manager in the front office. He goes, I think as much as Leo has his pitchers throwing, that uh, uh, they'll run out of gas by August. So I said, can I ask you, ask you a question? And he said, sure. I said, well, when I have my pitchers on the mound practicing that extra day at 60 feet, 6 inches, going downhill to a catcher, what do you do? He said, well, we have flat-footed throwing in the outfield. And I said, I said, well, why don't you explain to me the difference then? 
He said, well, the difference is they'll, they'll have a tendency to throw too hard when they're on the mound. I said, that's what the hell they pay you for is to regulate the effort. <laughs> so therefore, if you don't, if you can't regulate the effort, you know, you make your living at 60 feet, six is going downhill. You know, I had a, a pitching coach from uh, a, a former pitching coach say, well, what do you think about a side session where you put, put the guy three feet in front of the mound and throw 30 pitches? I said, number one, what are you putting him three feet in front of the mound for? And number two, why are you counting pitches on a side session? You might be done before that or maybe a little bit after that. But why aren't you on the mound going downhill? So those programs come into play. And Bobby was convinced then that he said he liked my programs and that they were in place. And then we all started. He stayed in close communication with me from 86 to 90 when we both went on the field together. And uh, a lot of things happened in between there. But it was basically a five-man rotation where you pitched, took a day off, had two side sessions, took a day off, and pitched so that I could be able to keep them just as sharp in a four, yet healthy in a five. And it worked out great. Leo, can you talk a little bit more about your relationship with Bobby and how much autonomy he gave you? And then what would your advice, you know, your advice to guys like Caleb in terms of how does a pitching coach find that right match with a head coach to make sure that, you know, they can, they could do their job and feel like well, they are doing it. You know, it's it's not easy. I, I was with a lot of managers and other coaches who I thought were totally wrong. And I thought I, I got – Sane taught me well. Bobby Cox taught me well. Jim Beecham taught me well. Bobby Dews taught me well. But also I was around a whole bunch of coaches that taught me how not to do it. That was just as important to me as the guys that taught me well. But the, the ones that taught me well all had one thing in common. They were they, – they, they were teachers – they understood people, they could communicate, they knew when to be a little forceful, they knew when to give support. And when I got with Bobby in the big leagues, Hank Aaron told me when I, when, I, when I became a minor league coach, he says, Leo, I don't care what you do, take care of the pitchers. When I got to the big leagues with Bobby Cox, guess what he told me the first day I was there? He said, Leo, number, I don't care what you do, you take care of those pitchers, you be with them, get to know them, learn them, know everything about them, and he said, I want you to remember one thing. Just because a pitcher's in the big leagues, don't take for granted that he knows what he's doing. And from then, we, just, we developed a great relationship. But our relationship started in 1986 through double A, triple A, A ball. And Bobby and I both loved the minor leagues. You know, I was in it for, uh, uh, in the minors for a long time. And, uh, and uh, so I understand what everybody goes through in the minors. But – in the minors then, the manager and the coaches had, had pitching coach had freedom to do what they wanted. Now you forget it. It's being dictated from up top, you know. And but uh, and then Bobby and I became very close and uh, had a great relationship. And he had, besides my father, he was the biggest influence on my life as anybody in the face of this earth. I, I love that because I think one of the things that you just mentioned is things that people are coming around to now. It used to be that for a long period of time, we were trying to baby pitchers, not have them throw and then ramp it up. Right. Um, and, and it's turning out, and same thing where we've done measurements uh, to prove kind of what you just said. So you said flat ground is as stressful as, can be is potentially stressful as throwing off a mound. Well, so now they're saying it's more stressful. Right, exactly. The front foot hits sooner. I mean, you got some help on the mound. You're creating a little help going down the hill. That's why it's on a hill for crying out loud, you know? So who's flat-footed throwing? Give me a break. Yeah, the only time yeah. we ever did flat-footed throwing is when we were playing catch, just getting loose. Had nothing to do with – flat-footed throwing should never, ever take the place of a side session on the mound. Yeah, and I, and I think it helps a ton with just not only arm, but also developing feel. Uh, it's it's huge. See, that's now that's your same guy. That's same talking there, a little feel and touch. So Maddox used to come up, up to me and go, hey, Leo, let's get out of the bullpen and do a little touch and feel. I said, no, it's feel and touch. And he, of course, he would do that. <laughs> Although with Maddox, you never know. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> even he, when he got over there, we, we'd already been to the World Series twice. But, you know, uh, he wanted to learn what we did, and I wanted to learn what he did. So basically, when I'm coaching pitchers, I always told them it's an exchange of ideas. I, I want to listen to you. Tell me what you feel. You know, and what do you like and what, do you, what don't you like? Then I'm going to tell you what, what works and maybe it will work for you. You know, but it, I, with the track record that we had, anybody that came into the organization in, in, in that time was going to go with it because there was too much success. 
But, you know, young guys like Steve Avery, how was he able to do that? Well, he had killer instinct, and he trusted a change of speeds at a very young age. So, but here's the ball. And I didn't teach Avery one pitch. They said, what did you, you didn't teach Avery a pitch? I said, no, my job was to help him. He's a number one draft pick. My job was to help him keep what he has. Well, see, I, I was around managers who looked at number one draft picks in the minors and said, well, you can't pitch like that. And he hasn't even pitched an inning yet. So they want to tinker with him. If somebody comes out of the minor leagues and he's had, he, and he's, you know, he's had success, then let him pitch the way he wants in, 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 for them, you know, how, how he, why he was signed. Now he's signed. Well, leave him alone. If he's having success, leave him alone. I love that. Uh, um, that's, I, I, think, I think a lot of coaches fall in the trap of putting their fingerprint on stamps, a Stamps, yeah. Stamp or exactly. fingerprint. Yeah. And these guys got there for a reason. It's, I, I know there's a story about you and John Smoltz where they were trying to change John Smoltz and have him throw a certain way. It's like, well, what do you, how do you throw a ball? Yeah. Well, you know, what? We, when we made the trade for John Smoltz, Bobby said we made a trade for John Smoltz. We traded Doyle Alexander. Well, number one, Doyle Alexander was there to help Detroit win a pennant. And Smoltz was part of the, going to be the rebuilding process with Glavin and Kent Merker and Tommy Green and, and Mike Stanton and Pete Smith and, and uh, uh, Steve Avery. And so we had all this get, – getting this lined up. And uh, so Bobby says, take Smoltzy down to the instruction league, and you go on the backfield with him and go one-on-one. -on -one. Don't worry about all those other pitchers down there. He said, that's your job every day is to be with him. So we're down there in his first uh, bullpen session with him, and after four pitches, he goes, no, that ain't right, that ain't right. I said, what ain't right? I said, I didn't say nothing. And he goes, well, my front side and da-da-da-da. And I went, would you, would you give it a break? I said – he said, well, in Detroit – I said, you're not in Detroit. I said, would you do me a favor? I said, would you wind up and throw the ball the way you would like to? And he wound up and threw the ball, and I said, and I said that's one of the most beautiful deliveries I've ever seen. He didn't believe me. Oh, no. I said, do it again and repeat it. Because Smoltz, here's, here's what, he came, what Bobby said he came with. A fastball, a great arm, loose arm, no command of a fastball, no breaking ball. He had won two games in double A or something like that, or A, one, a or double A. So all of a sudden, he's, he starts throwing the way he wants to, right? And he's hitting the target. I mean, he's hitting the target every time. And I'm going, well, he's not wild, you know. I mean, uh, it doesn't look wild to me. And then I introduced him to a throw, turn, and, break, throw, turn, and pull breaking ball, which was Johnny Sane's uh, uh, signature breaking ball, where you would throw it first, turn it, and pull it in. And he says, show me how to do that. So, he, and he, you know, he just, I said, center the ball in your hand and spin it. I said, now turn the ball, just turn it and pull it and spin it. And it turned the corner a little bit. And we turned the corner, turned the corner, turned the corner. I said, now turn this one as much as you want. And it went, woof. <laughs> and I went, geez. You know. So anyway, so we started doing that two days on, one day off, two days on, one day off. Then when he started cranking it up, it was every other day. Now we build him up to pitch an inning in, in the instruction league. Hey, he strikes out. It's, an, it's no contest. Now we've got to build up to five innings, and it's no contest. So Bobby calls me and says, Leo, he says, how's Smoltz doing? I said, exploding fastball when he's throwing strikes with it. I said, one of the best breaking balls I've ever seen. He goes, oh, that can't be right. That can't, that, no, 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 no. And I said, why don't you come on? He's pitching Thursday. Why don't you come on down and watch him throw? He goes, you know what? I'm going to do that. So he flew in. He flies in. He goes, don't tell nobody I'm coming in. I'll be up in the press box behind. Nobody will even know I'm here. I don't want him getting nervous. He went five innings and struck out eight with one walk. So he looks at me and he goes, Bobby looks at me and he goes, how did you do that? And I said, I let him be himself. And that's all I said. And Spark Anderson asked me the same thing when we went down to Detroit later on when playing in Lakeland. Hey, Mazzoni, hey, Mazzoni. I said, yeah, Spark. He goes, how in the hell did you figure out Smoltz? We couldn't. I said, I let him be himself, Spark. He goes, smartest thing I ever heard. <laughs> that, that reminds me of a story that Caleb told me uh, about you. It sounds like the, the this – this initial kind of bullpen session with you really sets the tone for your relationship with these guys. Um, Caleb, you told me the story about Greg Maddox that, that really struck, uh, struck you. Can, can you tell that story? And then, you know, Caleb, how have you, you deal with new guys every year, you know, like you have a whole new staff almost every other year. So what was that story you told me about uh, Leo and Greg Maddox and, and how do you approach, you know, what you've learned from Leo about setting that, you know, that stage right away with them. Right. You know, well, 
I'll, I'll do my best job telling the story and uh, Leo can clean it up if he needs to. But, you know, the, the way Leo told it to me was obviously they get, they get Maddox over in this, in this, you know, over here. And obviously he's done everything that he's done in Chicago and he's good and he's got a big reputation. And, you know, he comes over in his first side session with Leo, he's, he's throwing and, you know, he turns around and, and asks Leo, so well, what do you think? And Leo says, well, you know, not very impressed, you know, it's just okay. And, and Leah, and he just kind of flips on the ball and, you know, walks off and comes back the next day and basically says, you know, I just kind of wanted to see if you were going to BS me because of my last name, or if you were going to actually be willing to coach me and, you know, and go from there. And I think that's the thing that obviously has drawn me to Leo is he's here to coach. He's here to develop. He's here to help these guys become them best their best self and you know we're in a unique advantage at, at the college level where at the professional level you know obviously coaches are having some sort of input I would I would say and who's getting drafted and, and so on well, at least then you know we're choosing who's coming to play for us we get to handpick our guys I mean as pitching coaches we're the ones on the road handpicking so to speak you know our high school guys that we get an opportunity to coach and just like Leo said for us it, it, you know, if I'm going to go out and recruit a guy and try and convince him to come play for me, obviously there's something that he's doing already that I like enough to where when he gets in, and I tell all my guys this, you know, when I'm recruiting them and their parents, when they ask about development, everybody wants to know about development and throwing programs and stuff like that. So listen, you know, if I don't think your son is good enough to play, then I just wouldn't recruit him. But since you guys are here in our office, obviously there's something he's doing right now that's already good enough. So when we get them in, we just want to, A, first and foremost, always with everybody is keep them healthy. And then B, from there, just continue to try and develop and hone their craft and what they've done up until whether they're 17 or 18, whenever we get them, just try and hone it and, and continue to make them better. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, and, and this is what I was telling you about a little bit, Josh, over the phone through some of our talks is you, you've got a guy like Leah who's got all this, you know, reputation and he's done this and done that and probably – uh, you know, the most successful pitching coach in the game, and he's just easy to relate to. You know, he's a guy that when he gets his guys on the mound, he talks to them. But more than talking to them, he listens to them. And that's a big part that I think so many of us, including myself at times, miss, is just as a coach, you're not always the one talking. You got to be the guy listening sometimes too. And, you know, they, these kids could be 18, but they come in, and they've got confidence in what they've done. You brought them here. That gave them a boost of confidence. And you get them to want to change everything. And all of a sudden, they start second-guessing. They've done for the you know, last 14, 15 years of their life. And they don't know where they are. And I think our job is just, listen, we got them here for a reason. Now let's try and, A, keep them healthy. And then, B, continue to develop them from there. But I, I, I really, you know, I think it's that simple. Obviously, there's some more X's and O's that go into it. But at the end of the day, if these guys don't trust you enough to talk to you and explain stuff to you and you be willing to listen, then you're just not going to be able to develop them at any level, whether it's at the college level so, or big leagues. You know that initial meetings that you're talking about? I'm going to give you three examples that not too many people know about. Marvin Freeman, we make a trade for Marvin Freeman. He's not having any success in Philly, right? I said, come on down to the bullpen. I want you to throw some fastballs, but only at about a 80 to 90% effort. He comes out firing, just and gunning. And I said, apparently you don't understand what I said. I said, I want an 80 to 90% effort. I said, I don't want 100. He goes, well, that's all I know is how to do that. I said, I know. That's why you're over here now. Said, that's why Philly <laughs> let you go. He starts throwing at 80 to 90% and the bottom's falling out of the pit. It's a sinker. I said, did you see that? He goes, yeah. I said, would you trust that in the game? He goes, I don't know. I said, if you do, you'll have a lot of success. And if you don't, you'll be in the same boat that you are right now when you first got here. I said, but I know it can work. I said, that, that ball's sinking like that. You can tell a guy it's coming. When we got Jared Wright, Jared Wright threw 95 miles an hour, was let go by San Diego, didn't want him. Well, Jared Wright, I took him down to the bullpen. I said, CW, JW, I said, just throw these fastballs. I said, I want them all down and away, righty to righty. I said, throw them all down and away, but only give me about an 80, 85, 90% effort, not 100. You know, he, and he had a bad recoil, and he was, he was erratic in San Diego. And he's hitting the target every time without the recoil. And I said, would you trust that in the game? He goes, well, hell no, I wouldn't. 
I said, well, if you don't trust that in the game, you're going to be erratic, you're going to recoil, and you'll be all over the place again, and you'll end up doing what happened in San Diego, what happened here. I said, but if you trust it, you know, and he trusted it, started banging strikes with it. He became our go-to guy. Marvin was a setup guy with a good sinker. Jared ends up setup guy the first year, second year, 15-game winner, gets a big contract from the Yankees. And the other was John Burkett. And they asked John Burkett, they said, how come you had so much success under Mazzoni? Tampa didn't want you. He goes, what Leo told me, my slider sucked. And throw fastballs when it was slider situations. He goes, and everybody, everybody, nobody knew. He said, my 85-mile-an-hour fastball looked like it was 90. We went fastball change and a big curve, and he owned the down-and-away strike. So those are just examples of everybody that we came in contact with, with some initial meetings, all based on commanding the fastball down and away and being able to control your effort. Yeah. So from a recruiting standpoint, kids are taught, and, and, and obviously it jumps out at people when they see Velo. Um, everybody's you know, the, the 95 mile an hour guy, all the colleges are on them. What jumps out at you when you're looking at a pitcher um, other than Velo? Obviously, I know that, that if you were ranking things, Velo would be way down there, but it, it, kids are viewing it as table stakes to get a college offer. How do you get them beyond that? What jumps out at you as a pitcher? What makes you say, this is a guy that I want to work with? Well, I, what I look for, guys, and whether it's college or uh, pros or whatever, is life on the pitch. And how, you know, if it comes out of the hand in a smooth fashion and the ball jumps, has life on the pitch, whether it's movement or straight and explodes at the base of the, uh, the cutout at home plate, I look for life on a pitch. I mean, this term velo, I didn't even know what it meant until later on in my career. And I, you know what you can do with velo? You can shove it. Because what's happening is these kids are being told that. And then they try to reach up to hit that radar gun number because they're told they don't make a team. Well, that's why that's why 52% of Tommy John surgeries now are under 19 years of age. So I'm, I look for life on a pitch. And, and, and if somebody can show me that they can make a pitch and it looks like they're hardly working, I love that. If I see somebody throwing a pitch and he's grunting and groaning with everything in his body, I don't like that at all. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you said it in a different way that I would say it, but it's the exact same thing. I mean, I like a guy that's quiet over the rubber. I mean, to me, that's the number one thing, a guy that can be quiet in his delivery. And like Leo said, it almost looks like he's asleep on the mound, but the ball has late life at the plate. And that, you know, that's one, those guys are going to be more likely to stay healthy, first of all. And then those, those are going to be guys that you can actually work with. You, they're easy. Now, you can work with all, all guys, but those guys are going to be a little bit easier because they're, they're able to, A, to repeat their delivery, but they have a good understanding of what their delivery is like. And the next biggest thing to me is head movement. Uh, what a guy's head movement is like coming down the mouth. He's all over the place and outside of his body because uh, Leo teaches, you know, he's big on alignment and that we're, we're big on that here, being able to throw our fastball wherever we want. Obviously, the glove side strikes so are down and away. Uh, you know, whether you're right or your lefty is, is first and foremost. You got to stay on that pitch longest. Uh, but then being able to be sneaky quick, as Leo says, in on guys, whether they're right or your lefty. And head movement has a lot to do with that. It doesn't matter where your foot's going. If your head's running away from the baseball, we're just not going to have a lot of success. So those two things are the biggest things for us is just an opportunity to, you know, stay quiet over the rubber and, and then, uh, you know, your head movement. And then we can do a lot of the things that Leo's taught me to teach guys. Well, Caleb, how do we, it's such a benchmark though, right? For division one recruiting and it's what's put out there a, a ton. So how, you know, where's the balance to it? And then how do we get, how do, how do we change that culture? Is it even possible at this point? Well, you know, sure. I mean, we're in the position we've got today. And I think a lot of it is, is driven by video and social media and stuff like that. And, I, and listen, I think some of the, I think a lot of that stuff is fine. You know, um, I, if a guy sends me an email and says, hey, listen, I'm, this is my, I'm 6'3", 195, top of 92, okay, you know, obviously I'm going to be more intrigued to open that email than the guy that sends me one says I'm 5'10", you know, 170, and I'm 81, 82. Now that that guy can't get out, but the guy that's going to have a little more, you know, a little more life on his ball is going to have a little more room for air, so to speak. But it doesn't mean that guy's going to have more success. There's just maybe a, a different ceiling there for that guy. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, each coach is his own person. You know, I, I'll just tell you, I've coached plenty of guys at the college level that have all kinds of arm talent in terms of how hard they can throw a baseball, 
but can't get outs. And then I've had the exact opposite of guys that didn't have a ton of arm talent, but they were bulldogs between the years and they were coachable. And I listened and they listened and we got a lot of outs, you know? And so at the end of the day, I think a lot of it's just going to be on the individual coach. Um, guys that are willing to, to step out on a limb, so to speak, for the guy that doesn't necessarily throw 90 miles an hour. I mean, I think it, I think for some reason the 90 mile an hour, you know, that, that, you know, you see kids all the time, hey, first time 90 mile an hour club. It, it's just that stigma that, you know, I got to get there. And you don't, you don't. I mean, and uh, at the end of the day, it's just a coach being willing to work with the other guy that still have success with that other guy and not necessarily, you know, every, every college coach wants to sit there and rattle off, hey, here's my top eight, you know, 93, 95, so on and so forth. And, you know, and that's fun to be able to say. But at the end of the day, what I want to be able to do at the end of the year is look back and say, well, we won 40 games. And what's my best way to get there, you know? And so for us, I just – I think that's the way you got to approach it. And, again, it's each individual coach, you know, and right now, you know, college coaches are kind of driving this bus because these are the guys that we're going after. These are the only guys we're talking about. You're seeing kids in high school post five ERAs and they're committing to, to Division One schools and kids in high school posting two ERAs and they're going D2 and JUCO, you know. And so we're kind of the ones driving the bus. But at the end of the day, I think it's confidence in oneself as a coach to be able to work with guys like that and be able to, to help have those guys get some success. Yeah, I think to some extent it, it seems like no one gets fired if they bring in a 95-mile-an-hour guy because it's like, well, then it's up to the pitcher. He didn't, he didn't throw well. Um, he didn't work hard enough to be good. If you put out your reputation to bring in an 82-mile-an-hour guy who gets outs and he doesn't for some reason get out, gets outs, then it's on you. You just staked your reputation on it, which is kind of unfair, but that seems to be the way it is. Well, you How can't coach scared. Right. So I think that's a so, – Along those lines, how important is pitcher makeup? Um, hey, Leo, you coached pitchers that to me seemed like they had a bunch of different – I mean, Maddox was much different to me from Smoltz right. and from Glavin. Glavin's a kind of uh, cold-blooded guy. Yeah. And Smoltz was – so how important is makeup? What do you see in a pitcher? And how do you bring that out of him as a coach? Like, what? how do you optimize that? If you're, if you're spending a lot of time with him, you get to know him, and then you get to know uh, – uh, you, you know, I, I got a degree in psychology and I never went to college because your, your, your approach to the pitcher is based on their m mentality and their makeup, and that determines your presentation to the pitcher. And I did that even when it, you know, I'm talking A ball, double A, triple A, uh, rookie league, whatever. I just, uh, when you get, you take the time to know somebody. Number one, you got to know what you're talking about. And, you know, they find that out real quick. And, and, and number two, when they see themselves improving, then that trust factor jumps in. And then you can pretty much do anything you want with, with a particular pitcher. Um, you know, uh, but you have to spend time with them. And that time's being spent in the bullpen, throwing more often on a mound, going down. It, it makes a full circle. So when you're spending time with them, you get to know them. And when you get to know them, you know, they, 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 they're trying to get to the big leagues. And I want them to get to the big leagues. You know, and there's some buttons you have to push one way or the other to get the end result that you want. And that's just being with the individual, you know. It's like um, uh, when we got Russ Ortiz from San Francisco, right? When Russ came over, he says, uh, I said, Russ, what do you think San Francisco got rid of you for? I said, man, you're pretty good over there. He goes, they said, I walk too many people. I said, I don't give a damn how many you walk. He says, you don't? I said, no. He won 22 games. He still walked 80 or 90, but I didn't care. He won 22 games because he didn't care. You know what I mean? You know? I mean, it's just adapting to the individual. Glavin, stoic, you can, stoic figure, never give in, mentally tough as it, it can be. Smoltzy, emotional, bouncing around, and Maddox, cerebral, greatest control I've ever seen anybody in my life. And when he, when Maddox left at the end of his career with, uh, with us, and we knew, he, I knew he wasn't coming back through that door, I told him, I said, I want you to know that you taught me more than I taught you. And he goes, yeah, but you gave me some good tips. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody's, everybody's different, you know, but you have to spend time with that individual. This VLO stuff and how hard – let me tell you something, guys. There's a lot of lousy coaches out there. There's a lot of coaches that don't have the right information. I'm talking teen – there's a lot of good coaches. And they spend their time with the teenage kids. And there's – the, re the reason I affiliate with, with um, Kay Furman is Caleb and Coach Harker. 
They're the ones that made sense to me when we first initiated conversation. I've had conversations with a lot of college coaches, and I knew they weren't listening. And they, and they were just doing it out of courtesy. I want to go back a little bit to some of the stuff that you, you both were mentioning about listening uh, to, the, to, to your players and communicating. Um, and I'm actually going to try to – I'm not the pitching expert, Rob, and the rest of you guys are. So I'm going to try to focus on a couple of the other positions. Uh, Leo, what – First of all, was Javi Lopez underrated uh, or, or not respected on the national scale? Maybe like uh, I think he should have been. And what was like? What was? What were you learning from him? How important was he to your success? And how did you guys have to work together? Well, uh, Javi Lopez was a great catcher, and his setup. If you watched, uh, I was talking to Caleb about this. If you're watching some of those Braves World Series games and you're locked in behind home plate, his setup was as good as any setup I've seen in all of. Uh, in all of baseball and you know and he had tremendous power and was a great kid and uh you know my relationship with hobby was hobby said you know let the pitchers you know whatever they want to do i'm here to to help so you know our our goal with the catchers was have a good presentation to the pitcher have a good presentation to the umpire so that we could get more strikes okay and the other one was that i used to tell them was when you put that finger down, you're making a suggestion. All right. I want the pitcher making the final decision. Now, the reason I want that is not because you, they're going to be in sync over the over a period of time, you know. But what what I wanted, why I wanted that was for was because you wouldn't have a pitcher coming in and saying, "Why did you want to throw that pitch?" I'd rather have a pitcher make a mistake with a pitch but throw it with conviction than a pitch that he throw you made a mistake with and didn't want to throw it. So you right. make your selection and throw with conviction. So, and we always talk and just with Hobby. Hobby would say, Leo, he goes, and he, he knew when somebody was starting to lose it a little bit or whatever, and he, he was just a, a great catcher. Wouldn't it have, but in, wouldn't your catcher need to be, I mean, it's an extension of you, right? They got the better view of what, what's happening. How much time did you spend with the catchers, maybe without the pitchers even present, and, and working with them? Or that didn't happen? They just got that, it that done. Did, that, no, that, did, that didn't happen. My time was with the pitchers. And then the pitchers were going to dictate what was going on, period. You know, uh, the period was, hey, set up, catch the ball. Being, but now it's great when, you're, when, when they get to know the guys. You know, we had great catchers, Johnny Estrada, Charlie O'Brien. Javi was almost a Hall of Fame catcher, maybe is, uh, with power when you combine everything. And one of the greatest individuals you ever want to meet in your life. And they, there wasn't any problem with anything. You know, we had – Pat Corrales worked with the catchers. I worked with the pitchers. But, you know, and you know what I mean? So, you know, Pat would do a great job with the catchers, understanding what you want to do with the pitchers, and I, and I was on the other end. So, basically, you stay in your own firing lane. You know what I mean? There's too many people to stick their nose in where it doesn't belong. You what know, about, they, they so I'm sorry. What about, like – I mean, even if it's just communication, then I guess with the other coaches, like infielders, understanding what the pitcher's ball is doing and how to maybe make little shifts themselves and things right. like that. Like, what was the communication going on between you and the other coaches so that the guys on the field in other positions did know, you know, how to play best for Well, yeah. Well, you had Jimmy Williams who was a third base coach. He also positioned our defense. So Jimmy knew our pitchers and what they threw and the defense. But the bottom line was this. Bobby Cox told the pitchers, he said, if, if, you, if you're on the mound and you look around and you don't like where somebody's playing, you have the option to move them. That way the pitchers can't come in and say, hey, well, where are we playing this guy? You see what I mean? So that was eliminated. I didn't want to throw that pitch. That was eliminated. So Bobby gave them the option to, if you didn't like it, you know, move them, you know. Maddox, you know, Maddox was the was the greatest. He could set up a defense better than anybody. He could almost he could almost tell tell the guys the ball was coming to them. He's the only one I ever seen do that. And you know, um, you know, uh, he'd look at somebody and say, "This ball's coming to you," <laughs> and it would, you know. And uh, uh, but you know, he was so you know he was he's a different bird, a Hall of Fame bird too. So anyway, <laughs> so Bobby Bobby told the 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 the, uh, the, the pitchers that. Jimmy positioned the defense, you know, and so therefore you had everybody working in unison. It wasn't just me going, okay, the defense go here and the catchers. You go, no, Corrales took care of the catchers. I took care of the pitchers. Jimmy Williams took care of the defense. 
and Bobby Cox took care of it all. And if Bobby Cox didn't like something, he'd, he, would, he would come to you and say, what are we doing here? So how do you develop that for, for coaches? So I see a lot of coaches that want to take control over pitches, calling everything. And I think it detracts from, number one, it gives pitchers uh, kind of excuses uh, to, to blame the, the coach. I totally agree with that. Um, and coaches feel like they have to have control over everything. How do you develop that in a coach where they have that feel to allow a pitcher to be himself? And, uh, I mean, what advice do you have for, for well, it's, it's, like it's common sense. You know, you, 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 it's common sense. I mean, you know, when, you're, when, you're, when, when, you, when you work for somebody, you know, you want to you – you've got to be honest, yet you, and you've got to be supportive. You've got to be able to uh, push harder when you're going well and give more support when you're not. Uh, and, and let them know that you care, you know, and that's not, I don't, I, but I don't need it in a, like a brown nosing way or whatever, anything like that. Just, they need support. They, they want to get better, you know, and, and we want them to get better. And, but the thing is, it makes a full circle. Again, if you're healthy, you have a chance to get better. If you don't, you ain't gonna, you know, I, I think it's so easy for coaches to, push when things aren't going well and you right. sense that fear in a coach and it actually makes things spiral. And then when things are going well, no matter what, they're like, Hey, you know, they're slapping everybody on the back and it should be, I mean, what you're saying is the reverse. Yeah, it should be the reverse, you know, and Sane always told me about that. He said, man, guys need support. They don't need somebody hollering at them and getting all over them when you're not going good. You could, you know what, you can push a little harder when you're going good, you know, but when they're going, when they're not, I'll give you a good example. Uh, uh, Steve Avery had a very difficult time in 1990 when he first came up. And uh, uh, he got banged around in a game in Atlanta. And uh, Bobby said, uh, Leo, I want you to go into the clubhouse and spend the rest of the game with Avery. We don't need you out here today. We're fine. This is early in the ballgame. He said, let's go in and spend the day in the clubhouse with Avery in the night. I said, okay. So I go in the clubhouse, and Avery's sitting in his locker, you know, pretty down. So I went over to him, you know, and I said, hey, Steve, I said, you yeah, feel bad, don't you? He goes, yeah. I said, let yourself down, let your parents down. You let the team down, you know, all, what a lousy day, huh? He goes, yeah. I said, well, let me tell you one thing right now. I said, when you get accustomed to the, your environment in the big leagues, I said, payback's going to be a bitch for the rest of the National League. And I said, I'll tell you another thing. We'd go to war with you any day of the week. I can tell you that right now. We'll go to war with you any day of the week. Now let's go get a beer. Anyway. Just an That's example, fantastic. you know, an example, you know, or going out to the mound and telling Smoltz to get his head out of his butt, you know. And, the, and he says, well, Leo, the catcher just told me that. I said, we don't need to hear it twice. I'll go back in. <laughs> I wanted to ask you that about mound visits. I feel like mound visits at a, at a college level, you know, I can, I can understand what's happening there. Um, but what, are, they, are they different at the pro level? Like, are you going out there, treating them like a kid sometimes, saying get your head out of your butt? Or what, what, what might be the difference there? Well, I think it's the same. I, you, you, you adapt to the personality. Caleb's going to adapt to his pitcher's personalities. You know, it's the same. Very seldom would I ever go out there and talk strategy. When I, when I went out there, what I, was, I wanted to read, look in the pitcher's eyes, look at his face, you know, I was already watching his mechanics to see if he was showing me any signs of fatigue, you know, and, and what's his mental approach, et cetera. And you, know, you learn a lot with a mound visit like that, whether the guy's tired or not. And I wanted, I wanted to find his, out his physical, how he felt physically and mentally. And uh, usually you got that information out of him, you know. And uh, uh, so, Do you think we're taking too many mound visits these days? I, I, think, I think it can be overdone. You know, it's uh, we we didn't make a lot of mound visits. You know, one time, for example, one time Maddox told me he said, "I've had four starts and you've never come to the mound." I said, "Well, what do you want me to do? Make something up?" He goes, "No." He said, "But it gets lonely out there. I need somebody to visit me." And so he says, "I'm going to look in, in the sixth inning tonight. When I look in, come on out and pay me a visit." You know, and we're playing the Mets. I went, "God, he knows he's already going six, right?" Sixth inning, he's got a shutout going. We're ahead three nothing. He looks in after one out and six. And Bobby goes, Leo, get your butt out there and 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 make sure he's all right. So I go running out there and he and I said, he says, how do I look like from in there? I said, oh, you look great. I said, you got a three hit shutout going. Yeah, you look great. He goes, well, good. I'm glad you came. He goes, I don't want to talk to Chipper. He said, I don't want to talk to the umpire. He said, and the catcher don't speak English. He said, so I'm glad you came out for a little, little, give me a little breather. 
And I said, is there anything else that you need before I go in? He goes, one question, coach. I said, what's that? He goes, does the bullpen need any work? I said, no, go nine. And I turned around and left. So, but see, I mean, so a lot of those mound visits, and it's not like Bull Durham either. Like, you know, that's, that's over-exaggerated. A mound visits to go out, and I can tell you this right now. I see, and I saw it all over the baseball when I was there. A lot of managers had sent the pitching coach out for a mound visit because they were just getting the, war, the relief pitcher up, and they were killing time. That never – I can count on one hand the 15 years I was with Bobby Cox that he ever told me, Leo, go out and kill some time. One, maybe two, three times in, in 15 years. Speaking of that, in bullpen, the, the closer role, Caleb, is a lot different at the – or at least it looks like a lot different at the college level, right? Uh, it's not so much a specialized thing. And it, how, how, what has Leo been able to teach you that you're able to transition to the college level in terms of that closer role, since it is yeah. very different for the pro. It, it's, it's very simple. You know, Leo told me, <clears throat> heck, maybe within the first conversation we ever had together about this actual topic, he said, you know what you do? You get all your pitchers together and you ask them, is there anybody here that doesn't feel like they can get three outs? And, you know, you're not going to coach a single kid at the collegiate level that doesn't feel like they can get three outs. You know, you know, yeah, there, there are some years where you just have a guy, you know, where you just have a guy that feeds off that adrenaline, he feeds off that situation, he wants to be in the game when the game is tight, and, and you may run to that guy more often than not. At the collegiate level, though, more often than not, though, man, you, you're just rolling with the guy that you have the most confidence in, so going to get you those three outs. And, um, you know, and I think it's funny because it's not some, you know, new theory or, or, or new thought. I mean, you see it in the big leagues every year in the playoffs where World Series, Game 7, Game 6, you know, Max Scherzer goes out for the ninth inning or, or the team's best pitcher goes out. Any of these guys can get three outs, you know. Now, you're not going to see somebody like that and you know, in June go out for the ninth inning, but when the game's on the line, and for us, we don't play 162 games, you know, and our conference series are our big weekend. So when it comes down to the ninth, we're going to run out, out there whoever we think gives us the best opportunity to, to get those three outs. And it might have been the guy that started for us on Tuesday night, uh, it, it, or it might be our closer, whatever. Uh, but it's going to be the guy that we think can get three outs the quickest and get us on the bus and get home. Leo, um, you guys jumped around late 80s, early 90s with some closers until finally Mark Wallers, John Rocker stuck for you guys. What, what made those guys work for you? Well, I, I think that they had, you know, you had great, they had great stuff. And, you know, they, they relished that, that uh, attention. They loved that, you know. Uh, you know, for example, Alejandro Pena saved a bunch of games for us, right? And they asked him, how come you're saving games? You never saved games before. He goes, he says, ah, he says, I only got to get three outs. He goes, I can do that with my fastball. Kerry Lightenbird saved 30 games for us coming out of an independent league. You know why? He didn't care whether it was a ninth inning or not. And then we had um, Stanton and Merker could close out some games for us. Greg McMichael with a great changeout could close out some games for us. But Wollers had great stuff. I mean, he, you know, he threw a legitimate 97 or whatever, not like today. Anytime you see the radar gun today, subtract five. Just subtract five. And because they don't time it coming across the home plate. And so, and then Wolters had a great split, the great breaking ball. So, you know, uh, I mean, he was lights out. For example, uh, the other night when, when uh, I remember a conversation I had with Bobby in game, game six of Glavin's one to nothing game. So Wolters is coming in to p- pitch the ninth. And I said, you know, Bobby, I said, if Lofton gets on, you know, he's going to steal second, steal third. He goes, I know that, Leo. He goes, but you know what? Wolters is the only pitcher we got that can strike out the side. Baerga is 0 for 3. Left center field. Grissom on the run. The team of the 90s has its world championship. See what I mean? And Rocker was just, you know, he he was a, 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 he just, he loved it. I mean, he loved the crowd. He loved the attention. And Buddy backed it up with good stuff. Hard fastball. And you know what he could do that nobody realizes? He could control his breaking ball and make it smaller or bigger, depending on the count. And for two and a half years, he was he was tremendous. The only the only reason uh, he just, you know, he hurt his arm. I mean, he, he blew out. And, 
when you watched him throw, it's easy to figure out why, you know, but that you weren't going to change that. That's for sure. So uh, they were great closers, but we had a lot of great closers. I mean, uh, but Wohler's pure stuff. And it was, was tremendous. On the next episode of learning from Leo. You ever hear a pitch say, well, I can't walk the guy because the base is loaded. Yes, you can. If you only give up one run, you can. I never ran into a pitcher that I didn't like. Glavin owned the down and away strike. Maddox owned the down and away strike. Smoltz owned the down and away strike. If you don't own the down and away strike, throw it all out the window. I think everything they're doing now, we did. Only they word it differently. I saw players lose respect for coaches that did that sort of thing. It's a great term to use, firm. Be firm those pitches up. Last I heard, you can't steal first. It's Smoltz. So what the hell are you doing? I said, well, 30, that's 32 straight fastballs. You're hearing Johnny Sane and me speak the same language. Because we, you know, we were kind of rebels. If we, if we went strike one, we were going to win. But you can't improve velocity unless you throw a baseball. That's harder on your arm than staying in your own routine. Wait do you hear this. What, what, if he, what if he had to pitch that night? I said, that's what we were preparing for. Your most important pitch is always your next pitch. This program does not work. No, that was my analytics, okay? And here's what you got to remember. Both, a lot of guys, when their velocity went down, quit trusting their fastball and start trying to trick a hitter. It was everybody for 15 years. I said, Hit, hitters have egos, and I'm going to take advantage of them. This is the key, guys. They control their effort. I am being paid for what I've done, not what I'm about to do. What would you take away from your experience uh, in Baltimore? It's miserable. <laughs>